Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace, and thank you for joining us for a conversation on the U.N. approach to preventing atrocities. I am Philippe Leroux-Martin. I'm the Director for Governance, Justice, and Security here at USIP. Uh, I have the honor today of welcoming Alice Warimu Andaritu, Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with USIP, uh, USIP was established by the US Congress in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan, national institution dedicated to preventing, mitigating, and helping resolve violent conflict abroad. Throughout the Institute's history, uh, we have supported U.S. efforts to prevent and respond to mass atrocities, including in 2009 when we uh, co-chaired the Genocide Prevention Task Force, which has provided the broad framework for U.S. atrocity prevention and response policy. Over the past year, USIP has re-energized and expanded this role to address indicators of rising risk of mass atrocities, to protect civilians and to hold perpetrators of atrocities accountable. The Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide plays a critical role in strengthening the UN's ability to prevent and respond to atrocities, including providing early warning on high-risk atrocity situations and recommending measures to mitigate atrocity risk. The office also engages member states on issues such as hate speech and genocide denial, core indicators of rising atrocity risk, and works in partnership with member states and civil society to develop plans to mitigate those risks. This work is central to the UN's ability to prevent atrocities and to pr protect vulnerable civilian populations. So we're very pleased today to have Ms. Enderitu here to talk about her work and the work that her office is doing and the ways in which she supports the UN in better protecting civilian populations. Ms. Enderitu is not a newcomer to USIP. We've been working uh, together with uh, Ms. Enderitu and her teams throughout the years. Uh, and uh, it is a pleasure to have her uh, here back at one of her many homes uh, around the world. And we're extremely pleased to be able to have her uh, with, us, uh, with us today. Uh, she's a recognized voice in the field of peace building and violence prevention, having led as mediator and senior advisor in reconciliation processes. She also served as commissioner of the National Cohesion and Integration Commission in Kenya, as well as founding member and co-chair of the Uwiano Platform for Peace, a prevention agency linking early warning to early response. She was also one of the founders of Community Voices for Peace and Pluralism, which is a network of African women professionals preventing, transforming, and solving violent ethnic, racial, and religious conflicts worldwide. Widely published, she is the recipient of numerous awards, recognizing her commitment to peaceful conflict transformation throughout Africa and her innovative approach to mediation. Our online viewers are welcome to join in the discussion using the chat box on our event webpage and the hashtag USIP Atrocity Prevention. So I'm very pleased to now turn the floor to Ms. Enderitu for her remarks. Thank you very much to USAP for having me again. This is the first time I'm coming to USAP in this capacity, but I've been here several times before. And uh, I do know that uh, USAP has provided opportunities um, for me and others um, to voice um, quite a number of issues. And so really, I'm glad to be here today. So I appreciate the important work of USIP, which I know quite well. And uh, in my new capacity as a special advisor for the prevention of genocide, which is not so new because I've been around now for two years, uh, my role in that of my office is to act as a catalyst to raise alarm to the Secretary General and through him to the Security Council and other relevant actors 
on situations where there is a risk of genocide or related crimes and make recommendations for preventative action. So together with the Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect, my office works under a common methodology for the prevention of atrocity crimes, by which I mean genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So this mandate is global, meaning that my office looks at situations worldwide where there's a risk that atrocity crimes could occur. This is because there's no part of the world that is immune to the risk of these crimes, and in fact, all societies may have some indicators of risk. And it is often how societies respond to these risks that determine if a situation escalates into more serious concern, including in the most serious instances, the commission of atrocity crimes. Now, based on my experience as a mediator and as a peace builder of many years standing, I do consider it as a priority to translate from an intergenerational perspective the concept of genocide prevention as an international and national norm into a practical reality implemented at community levels. So much research points at atrocities happening within local communities, pointing at civilians as a primary target. And I say so from personal experience, knowing that in all the places that I have worked, that I've often seen atrocity crimes happening to people on the ground, and people on the ground at the community level, all the civilians who are the targets of these attacks, um, not only not recognizing that what's happening to them is an atrocity, so they do not understand that this is not violence, that this is not armed conflict, that this is an atrocity crime, and therefore they do not have the capacity to engage with what is happening to them from a perspective of um, what do you do when atrocity crimes are happening to you. And that's been one of my key driving forces um, to take this whole concept of prevention of genocide that has such an international approach, such a regional approach, such a national approach to the extent that often we expect governments to react. We do not expect um, the people who are targeted to have any agency to do something about this. We need to take that to the level where these communities know that they have some agency and know how to recognize what's happening to them. So in light of that, what we do, we collect and analyze information on risks of genocide. We follow up on sources, and that includes field visits. So for example, I just arrived yesterday morning from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We verify information, and all this we do on the basis of the framework of analysis of atrocity crimes, which is a tool that's available on our website, developed by my office, to assess risks of genocide and other atrocity crimes. This tool sets out the most common risk factors of atrocity crimes and corresponding indicators. So when we verify this information, we are then able to provide early warning on actions to prevent or hold genocide to the Secretary General and Security Council on situations that could escalate to atrocity crimes. So this tool is also used by all actors, government, civil society, academia, and it's also used uh, by us in the UN system as well. So for example, um, I had a team coming to see me uh, of indigenous people from Brazil, and they've analyzed uh, what's been happening to them on the basis of this framework of analysis. And so therefore, they are able to say, and which is why I'm talking about the agency that people have on the ground, they are able to say, according to this framework of analysis of atrocity crimes, which is the UN official policy on analyzing atrocity crimes, what is happening to us, um, we see it as an atrocity. So my mandate is important for what it says, but also important for what it does not say. So for example, it does not equip me with the prerogative of determining whether genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity have been committed, because only a competent, independent court of justice can determine this. At the same time, accountability is so central to my mandate, especially in situations where there are serious allegations of commission of atrocity crimes. So in such situations, without 
accountability, we do know that perpetrators might feel invited to continue committing such crimes in light of ongoing impunity, or victims may decide to seek revenge if they find no appropriate criminal accountability or judicial venue to address their allegations. So there is still the perception that pursuing accountability can be detrimental to making and sustaining peace. Many see a contradiction in pursuing peace and justice as if these two were different and mutually exclusive categories. So as many, we at the United Nations, we do not see things that way. On the contrary, accountability constitutes a key component of peace. Without it, when there is impunity for past perpetrators, the circle of revenge is fueled and can continue. So I must say um, to you that I came to the United Nations strongly conscious of the millions, maybe even billions of people around the world who know that atrocity crimes are going to happen to them and they have nobody to tell. And um, I remain conscious of that fact every day when I wake up and I'm going to work, I think about those people because I know them. I know that experience, I've lived it. And um, we who work in this field of um, prevention of atrocity crimes, we work with the reality of knowing that um, the prevention of atrocity crimes has made great progress in identifying factors, putting a society at greater risk of experiencing atrocities. We also know that this has not translated into widespread effective early warning and response mechanisms to prevent their commission. So this means that where early warning concerns are raised, prompt, well-informed early response actions on atrocity crimes are not happening in many parts of the world. So there are many reasons for this, because atrocity crimes do not only happen during armed conflict, sometimes they happen, for instance, with indigenous people, like I've just mentioned, or with migrants or refugees in many countries that are not in conflict. So prevention, we know, also costs money, and it's often hard to make the case because the outcome of prevention absence of atrocity crime sometimes cannot be proven. Indeed, I've noticed on our Twitter page, one of the questions I get asked most often is, so how many genocides have you prevented? Can you prove it? So it's so difficult to prove what you've prevented, and that really becomes um, um, the, what uh, those of us who work in prevention know. So we do know uh, that there is almost unanimous consensus that the primary responsibility to prevent rests first and foremost with national governments. And this responsibility is clearly articulated in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which not only obligates states not to commit genocide, but also obligates them um, to prevent genocide, to punish genocide, and enact the necessary legislation to give effort to the provisions of the convention. And with that in mind, we are paying specific attention to the 153 countries that have ratified the genocide convention, the 1948 genocide convention, um, supporting them in domesticating, supporting them in creating policies, legislation, that then support um, this um, genocide convention in that criminalize genocide. People think that genocide is so far away from them, but genocide is with us. It's always a step away. So we therefore also support strengthening institutions, independent human rights institutions um, all over the world. Uh, we strengthen institutional dispute resolution institutions, um, judicial institutions. We work with law enforcement. Um, we work with electoral commissions, and we advance implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, each of which has its own indicators and measures of success. And as I often say, every failed sustainable development goal creates a risk factor for atrocity crimes. That is not far-fetched. When you think about food security, for example, if you don't have food security, then that okay, already becomes um, a risk factor. So we have learned from experience, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, that if we are more likely to succeed if we help connect the prevention dots for atrocity crimes systems um, worldwide and at country level, um, and 
if there is a bind from national governments, that's usually um, a great reason to succeed. But sometimes governments are those we need to prevent uh, from atrocity crimes. So prevention is also more likely when national actors are involved that go beyond government and also include other actors and institutions. So for example, we have a plan of action, um, a plan of action for religious leaders and actors uh, to prevent violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. Um, we are in the process of uh, developing a similar plan of action with traditional leaders. We are also working uh, with the um, people in the business community, people in the sports community to develop these plans of action. We um, have another one that's ready that we are launching during the CSW, um, the first one ever of women, how women can work to prevent violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. And the whole approach towards this um, is, has been geared around identifying in societies who are the most influential actors and what is it that they need to do to prevent atrocity crimes. We are trying to normalize the language of prevention of atrocity crimes to all these constituencies so that when they speak it, then it becomes, people then take it seriously. So we also have um, great examples with academic institutions, for example, in the Costa Rica, uh, where the, the, the UN country team in Costa Rica is working with the University of Costa Rica, um, where they're producing, um, they have a plan of action on his speech, the UN country team, and that plan of action is in partnership with the university. So students in the university are researching on his speech, and so there is direct flow of information between the research and the action that the, the UN is taking. So success, of course, is likely to depend on how sustainable these kind of efforts are. And we need targeted interventions that are important um, in, in terms of their impact, but also important in terms of sustainability. So therefore, um, for risk assessment and analysis, in addition to offering assistance to national authorities, and to communities, we work with so many civil society actors around the world. We also work with other assessment processes such as the universal periodic review process, which is so important because of its um, granular nature and uh, its universality. So I also conduct country visits in the, which uh, we fact find. Like I said, I just came from the DRC. Um, I've been to quite a number of countries this year. I've been to Iraq, um, I've been to Central Asia, I've been to Kyrgyzstan, I've uh, been to Bangladesh, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to quite a number of places. And in all these places, um, we build information, we do conduct assessment exercises on risk factors in our framework of analysis with national actors when they are willing to do this. And um, for example, we did this with special jurisdiction for peace institutions in Colombia. And we also support um, the development and implementation of hate speech action plans in coordination with UN country teams. And in terms of uh, provision of visibility to good practices at, at country level, uh, my office is, is very powerful around that. So I've mentioned hate speech. My office also leads the implementation of the United Nations strategy and plan of action on hate speech, which was launched by the Secretary General in 2019. This strategy sets out guidance for United Nations entities and other societal actors to address hate speech at the national and global level, enhance efforts to tackle the root causes and drivers of hate speech, including racism and racial discrimination, therefore enabling effective responses by the United Nations system to the impact of hate speech on societies. This strategy is in line with international human rights standards and with the right to freedom of opinion and expression. And we often say we are not saying people shouldn't speak. We are saying we should speak more, but we should speak more um, from a responsible perspective. And in that respect, we are supporting globally um, several UN country teams around the world, peacekeeping and special political missions and member states who have developed and implemented context-specific action plans on his speech. And um, I often say that um, Lots of analysis is done around the world, but when there is analysis, because some of the national governments have also started um, writing up their own national action plans on his speech, to see um, what a country 
um, thinks is hate speech, to see what a country feels is a, is a threshold for incitement to violence, because that's what we look at when looking at hate speech. It's a completely different way of, of looking at things. So I've spoken about um, our plans of action, um, and I've spoken about the fact that we look at all these influential mitigating um, actors in society. So we have work that we are working on with parliaments as well um, to develop plans of action, both for themselves on how to um, deal with the hate speech that happens in parliaments, where, of course, in, in many cases, you can get away, uh, you have the freedom to say whatever you want in parliament, including most sometimes, including um, what could be considered as hate speech. And we are supporting scholars um, in the development of examinable courses and academic modules um, incorporating genocide studies and prevention, some of it into existing teaching and some of it as new teaching. So, so far we've had um, a meeting with African scholars. Uh, we met in December last year in Dakar to develop the continent's um, first atrocity prevention uh, curriculum. And um, they, we, when we were looking for the scholars to come, we decided not to place this in any discipline. So we looked for scholars. So we had agricultural engineers in the room. We had nutritionists. We had uh, lawyers. We had, and all of them. Because, you know, from experience, I know, atrocity crimes, when they happen, they happen to everyone. Genocides, war crimes, crimes against humanities, they don't spare engineers. They, they don't spare architects. They happen to everyone. So we had everyone in the room giving us their perspective of how do you interpret the prevention of atrocity crimes from an architectural perspective. When you think about um, who builds the torture chambers um, in places where atrocity crimes happen, when if you go to Auschwitz and you see that gas chamber and you think to yourself, who built this? And were they ever held accountable? When, when you think about um, the justice system that we have that focuses so strongly on the person with the highest responsibility and then doesn't focus on people who hold um, lower responsibilities, then you see the need to engage everyone um, on this perspective. We've also done the same thing um, with, with Asian scholars, and um, we already have um, an atrocity um, crimes curriculum for universities that's already being piloted in universities in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Thailand. We have a teacher training module for secondary school students. Again, that's already being piloted. Um, we have also worked uh, with the European Union. We've um, set up an atrocity prevention toolkit that, again, is already being used. And I would say that um, in terms of all this communication is key uh, in terms of putting out all the issues. The UN, we have a working definition of hate speech. Um, we know that we don't have a universal definition of, of hate speech. And that's a challenge, because different countries have uh, different approaches to what they would call hate speech. And um, so our definition of hate speech um, is linked to the reason why the office that I lead is the one that's the United Nations focal point for hate speech. We do know that among, among the risk factors for genocide, uh, hate speech ranks high. You, to commit atrocity crimes, it's important uh, to dehumanize people, the people who are targeted um, for, for those crimes to be committed on them. And in dehumanizing those people, hate speech is used. And so um, we know that um, when the Holocaust was happening, for example, or when the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda was happening, when the, gen the genocide in Srebrenica was happening, that at that time, if social media existed, it didn't exist to the extent it does now. Um, and, um, and for the Holocaust, for example, it wasn't there at all. So we engage with tech and social media companies globally. Uh, we have a method um, that moved from condemning them in terms of what they do to sitting with them. So we have roundtables with them. 
and in these roundtables we discuss their business profit model. And I tell them, this is what your business profit model does to the mandate that we have. This is what happens when we have one whole year of work around an issue and then somebody from somewhere comes with a lie, with a falsehood and hits the button and this lie spreads around the world. So these uh, roundtables produce recommendations for us to work together and on the basis of these roundtables we've been able to agree with tech and social media companies and um, they, they, we have um, virtually like all of them Twitter, Facebook, um, TikTok, all of them um, coming, Google, YouTube. We sit with them and for, on the basis of these recommendations, we agreed on their use of the working definition of the UN on hate speech to create algorithms. We agreed on the use of um, that definition um, to create uh, guidelines for content moderators. So there's been a lot of progress and the last meeting that uh, we had was just last week, um, Monday, the, the week, last week. And we discussed with them uh, the recommendations of the past years. We discussed self-regulation. We discussed, you know, and it's a Chatham House rule meeting. We close the door. We don't attribute anything to anyone. But we speak about these issues. We give them practical examples. We show them um, how hate speech is propagated, for example, in places where um, tech and social media companies who have expanded to the whole world don't have translation for local languages. We also show them places where images that could mean something in one place mean something completely different in another space. And um, we give them very practical, granular examples of how this works. We also uh, give them examples of uh, coded language and stereotypes that are used that then people get away with saying things that um, otherwise um, you wouldn't. No algorithm can catch. Uh, sometimes not even a human being content moderator can catch. You know, like for example, in Rwanda when they were targeting the Tutsi, they were talking about cutting the tall trees. No algorithm will capture that. We have so many uprooting the weeds we have uh, for the Rohingya um, remove the fleas. Just the other day I issued a statement when the, a general in Ethiopia said that they are going um, to go to Tigray and remove the lice. Um, so algorithms don't capture these kind of things. So um, we have key challenges um, when hate speech does not reach the threat of incitement, like the examples I've just um, given you or when it is in those languages that they don't have translation for. And last year, I, I briefed the Security Council on the topic of tech and social media companies addressing and countering hate speech, and I invited tech and social media companies to brief with me, and we had a very useful session. So in, in areas where genocide has been proven conclusively to have happened by competent courts, like the Holocaust, um, Srebrenica, Bosnia Herzegovina, 1995, Rwanda, 1994. We are extremely concerned about the divisive rhetoric which is giving rise to Holocaust denial and genocide denial. And you know, um, like many people, I used to find this completely ridiculous. Like how can somebody deny the Holocaust? How can you deny that a genocide happened? But I can tell you that um, in Bosnia Herzegovina, I was able to make <laughs> the connection between Holocaust deniers and genocide deniers. And um, how that happened was that I began to notice, because I've read a lot on Holocaust denial, and I began to notice that the arguments Holocaust deniers were making were the same arguments that were being made in Bosnia Herzegovina, and same arguments that were being made in Rwanda. So I began to see the connection and to realize the Holocaust deniers were giving the world a template of denial for atrocity crimes. And um, looking at all this and looking at um, connecting the dots, um, then realized that um, the um, conferences that have been held, for example, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, where there was actually a commission of inquiry, um, to prove that the genocide in Srebrenica did not happen. That conference was attended by Holocaust deniers, and they spoke at that conference. 
And then we have this picture, this photo from uh, Focha, in one of the cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where a young person born after the war, young people born after the war, um, have, you know, they have several murals um, in many places, um, especially in Republika Srpska area. And these photos, uh, these murals, are of people who've been convicted for genocide, and they treat them as heroes. And so we had these young people standing there, and they have the mural right in front of them, and they are saluting the mural with a Nazi salute. So I use that photo to explain to people, to those of us who are peace builders, those of us who are mediators, those of us who work to prevent atrocity crimes, that if they can unite, if Holocaust deniers, genocide deniers can unite, really we must unite and we must unite against them because um, they are not united for the sake of just uniting. They are uniting for the sake, I always say, denial of the Holocaust, denial of the genocide is preparation for another Holocaust, is preparation for another genocide. And I don't say this um, as in jest, I say this in complete seriousness and I can prove it. So what we've done we partnered um, with an organization uh, here in the US, the Jacob Blonstein Institute. We brought together a team of people um, uh, who then uh, began to form this core of people who need to stand up against this Holocaust in us, against this genocide in us. And um, we developed a policy document, it's on our website, on Holocaust and genocide denial. How do you combat Holocaust and genocide denial? It has some practical ideas on how we do this. And we do know that um, we cannot ignore the fact of um, in this world that there is a very, very, very lucrative field and business for willing buyer, willing seller um, of arms. So we've really moved from the space where um, in terms of um, uh, committing atrocities, uh, where we would be thinking that uh, this is something that is so far-fetched. We do know that atrocities are happening now. They are happening now in quite a number of places where um, the availability of, of, of weapons is um, always um, at an all-time high. And we do know that we are living within a reality of increased privatization of security at the community level, yet diplomatic efforts are often aimed at trust building at top political levels. So we haven't built diplomatic capacity at the local level. And I often tell the ambassadors I meet in uh, New York on a daily basis that I admire how they can fight and disagree in the General Assembly and then have coffee afterwards. And that's a capacity that we need to be able to take to the local level. How do people disagree and agree and then um, have coffee afterwards? So. Um, I, I would say that um, I do strongly believe that policing communities are the core of prevention when sufficiently and sustainably supported can be instrumental to effective action. And I do believe that ultimately prevention is local. I do know, of course, that, that governments have a lot of agency in ensuring that prevention is local. I do know sometimes governments do not want to ensure that prevention is local. And in countries that have experienced conflict in the past, when we bring together civil society and community leaders that represent a wide variety of constituencies to share their experiences, it, it becomes extremely vital to do so if the gains are to be sustainable and felt by all. And uh, at the end of the day, it's imperative. And that's why we are using the approach of finding out who is most influential in societies um, to ensure that we get agents of transformation who can contribute not only to changing narratives, but also to encourage everyone to do their part to advocate for, build and sustain peaceful coexistence. So I, I would really like to call on all countries in the world um, to prioritize prevention. Many of the conflicts that are happening now in the world, we had prior knowledge that they were going to happen. We've engaged behind the scenes with quite a number of these leaders. We engage um, 
uh, um, with them, them in terms of explaining to them where vulnerable populations also reside and where uh, atrocity crimes could happen. But this propensity for human beings to keep getting into wars um, is also the same propensity for human beings to get out of wars. We have um, spaces where we are able to um, live um, without wars for a period of time. And yet we have places where these wars keep going on and on and do not end. So I would just like to say that um, on that note, I'm grateful again to be here and to say that this discourse and analysis that's related to atrocity crimes, um, which has focused so almost exclusively on state level political interactions and missed out on this whole community and grassroots component of, of um, the local level, that it needs to be contextualized and meaningfully devolved to communities. So in terms of what I really feel strongly that uh, needs to be taken away from the conversation, that is it. Because we still have, and even in my capacity in this position right now, I still get phone calls from people who tell me we are going to be attacked on this day, at this time, by the following people. And when we are, and, and we, you please help us so that it doesn't happen. And so I reach out to all these networks and reach out to you know, the systems and reach out to everybody who can help. Sometimes it's too far uh, for the help to reach. Sometimes it's too remote. But when we can, we are able to stop it. And so ultimately, if we get a world where people know that they are going to be attacked, but they know who to tell, then really we will have gotten somewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Bailey. I'm the Senior Program Officer for Atrocity Prevention here at USIP. And I now have the honor of kicking off a facilitated discussion with Alice. Uh, I'm gonna start off just by asking Alice a question and then I would invite our audience to get engaged as well. We'll take questions in the room and then we'll also take questions from our online audience. You can use hashtag USIP atrocity prevention. Alice, thank you so much for those remarks. They were incredibly rich and comprehensive. I was struck by how vast your mandate really is. Prevention is a significant task. I wanted to start off with a question about how you, in your day-to-day -day work, balance the focus on prevention at the local level with your global mandate. How do you manage your state partners and the Security Council while still prioritizing prevention at the local level? Thank you very much. and. Um Again, thanks to everyone who made the time to come today and also to join online. Um, I'm able to balance the two because we have UN field presences in many places. So I work very closely with the United Nations resident coordinators. So in quite a number of countries around the world, we have UN presences, so then it becomes easy. But also, um, before I came to the UN, I had this huge network of people around the world, civil society, especially women, especially. I was in so many women networks. So I'm able to balance uh, because I can get very granular uh, feedback on what's going on on the ground uh, from the people that I knew in my past life, but I can also get uh, feedback from the UN field presences. So, um, so much of my work, like on a daily basis, um, is involves. Um, I speak a lot to the ambassadors in New York, the, the permanent representatives in New York and in Geneva. Uh, we speak about all kinds of things. Um, I'm always looking for ideas that could um, become resolutions sponsored by these member states. 
and um, putting them out. You know, last year we had great success, for example, with the Kingdom of Morocco, um, the permanent representative. He led um, this discussion that ended up becoming a resolution um, that actually gave us the first International Day of Countering Hate Speech. So this balance, but um, what really helps me is that I never forget. If you ask anyone I work with in the office, I always tell them I, I don't forget where I come from because I'll go back there. And when I go back there, I want to be able to go and tell them I did something for you. So I always connect the prevention dots. Thank you, that's really quite interesting. And good to see that not only are you a catalyst at the UN for these conversations, but a connector between the local and the, the uh, national and international. Just one more question from me that I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about your DRC trip uh, within this question, but it was very interesting for me and good to hear your comments on normalizing the language of atrocity crimes and that all states have risks. And I'd be curious to hear how you work with states to make them comfortable with that, because that's often a, a very sort of sensitive topic, the idea that a state has atrocity risk or is moving towards a potential risk of atrocities. How do you manage that process? And did that come up at all in your time in DRC? I would say in terms of the language of atrocity crimes, um, because they are so grave, you know, we talk about genocide as being the, the crime of crimes. And um, we know how difficult it is to prove it, because you have to prove intent. I'm not comfortable with, um, like, I'm, I don't try to normalize it to the extent that people feel that it's not threatening. People should be taken aback when they hear that we are talking about atrocity crimes in their context. We should be taken aback. Um, but at the same time, there remains such little knowledge um, among the people to whom atrocity crimes happens in communities in terms of at recognition. So which is when I talk about normalizing, I want people who atrocity crimes happen to, to be able to say, what is happening to me is a genocide. What is happening to me is a war crime. This is what I can do about it. This is who I can reach about it. This is how I can go about it. If my government is not responsive, this is what I should do. So that's what I mean by, by normalizing. So in the context of um, the DRC, we know the DRC is a country that has uh, been plagued with the uh, conflict violent conflict um, for years, for decades, decades. So much that goes on in the country um, has a lot um, to do, of course, with resources. There is the aspect of resources. And so we have the anomaly of uh, this country that is very rich in resources, but whose people are very poor. Um, so there is conflict of um, resources, but there is also conflict of um, Theology is also conflict of um, identity. And um, my being in DRC was in response to quite a number of issues that are happening around the country, just the East, West as well. So in, in due time, I'll be speaking out in the next week also with very concre concrete uh, statement on what um, is happening there and what I think should be done about it. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to open it up to our, our audience in the room. Uh, we do have a mic runner. Please feel free to raise your hands if you'd like to ask a question. Sally, we have down here. Over here. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, as a, a Palestinian refugee, uh, I, I know well what is a genocide, especially I married to a Bosnian. So I, I met survivors from Srebrenica, and I know that uh, my grandparents survived from the Palestinian genocide in 1948. Then now we are, uh, me and my colleagues are refugees in Lebanon. We can't even visit our hometown. My, my dad was born in Lebanon. He can't 
visit his hometown, and we can't enter to our hometown even, not to live there, to visit it. And it's some kilometers away. I just uh, wanted to share my story because I didn't hear anything about Palestine. And every day, genocide is happening there. Yesterday, they killed a 16 years old girl, before a child in school, before elderly. So just I wanted to, to note this, and thank you. We have someone in the back as well. Thank you for your comment. Hi, um, my name is Madeline Moreno. First of all, I wanted to thank you for being here. Um, I am a graduate student at American University here in DC, and I am curious, um, what is the relationship between, um, clearly your mandate is atrocity prevention, but what is the relationship with some of the other UN bodies that are tasked with um, sort of responding to atrocities? Um, I know you talked about uh, things you can do to combat hate speech, um, and what you can do when you know you receive a phone call that people are in danger, but um, I'm wondering about you know what can you really do for people like the Uyghurs who are interned in these camps and you know don't have access to um, phones or you know something like that that's already um, a genocide that's already underway. So uh, maybe I can I can ask Alice when when risk is rising, which I think is is sort of the focus of the question. What do you, what how does your work change? What are you doing to sort of address risk? How, what are you doing to help people who are at imminent risk or in, involved in an ongoing genocide? Um, thank you. Um, in terms of um, the connections of, of on the ground, um, we have the UN teams on the ground, so we speak directly to them in terms of the kind of issues um, that need to be responded to. Um, but I can tell you um, that response, because most often we expect the national government is expected to respond, to protect its civilians. It's not always the case, I know, and sometimes it's national governments that are actually uh, perpetuating these issues, uh, the atrocity crimes. Um, we work with the UN country teams on the ground to ensure a response. So for example, when you see um, like the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, the team that works on refugees, we have the UNDP. So like for example, right now, UNDP is doing a lot of work in uh, Nigeria, in Boko Haram territory, rebuilding homes, you know, um, rebuilding infrastructure. Um, the High Commissioner for Refugees, with who we have an MOU with, actually, on atrocity crimes and uh, their prevention, we work a lot with them because we don't have field offices. So, so many offices, UN offices, are doing things in terms of prevention um, around the world. And, uh, and response, sorry, not just uh, prevention. When I talked about for calling, um, I was speaking to the gravity of the larger situation because I know I'm speaking to people in the same field and that there is so much that can be done in this field of response. Response uh, is still weak. Response is still expected to be either by the international bodies like the UN or national governments, and that agency at the ground level is not there. In Kenya, uh, where I come from, we built this um, response, early warning link to early response, where um, we identified what is it people can do within the spaces there to respond to these kind of situations, because there is quite a bit that can be done. So. There is so much in this field of response that is not being done, that there isn't enough. There is a lot, uh, I would say, of indicators of um, atrocity crimes, but in terms of response, uh, we do need the support of the peace-building community um, to 
help us in the atrocity prevention community to help um, help to support the efforts that we are putting in place because clearly they are not enough. So for Palestine, um, I'm sorry that I could not mention all the countries, um, but I can tell you um, there is a lot that we do uh, behind the scenes in terms of informing all these debates that you see at the General Assembly, at the Security Council, and um, in terms of Palestine, in terms of um, working on, on issues to do with Palestine. Um, part of what I want to do next year, because it always helps, as I said in the speech, to understand the issues, but also to go to the ground. So, so part of what I would like to do um, next year, uh, hopefully, is to go to Israel, to go to Palestine, and um, get um, for myself the, the granular issues on the ground and see how is it that um, we can engage better. And it's not just Palestine, there are so many places where all the time um, people require um, the office. Um, we have people asking us about Kashmir, when can you do something about Kashmir? We have people talking about, um, of course, the um, Sahel in, in the uh, the whole Sahel, right now there's so much going on there, the Great Lakes region, there's so much going on. Not to undermine uh, what you've just said about Palestine, but you can be sure that um, we always have it um, on top of our radar. So, and then what is it you say that we are practically doing? I have mentioned some of the issues, working with these religious communities, working with them, um, and when we say working with religious communities, we work with religious communities from around the world to actually, when we know that something is happening, and which I think then goes back to the question of uh, how do you prove what you've prevented? When, because my job is to say, this is about to happen, how do we stop this? So beyond working with, with the religious leaders and the media and all these other constituencies, there are very practical ways that we work on in terms of, for example, ensuring that policies, ensuring that um, governments are speaking to each other. And so, for example, like the DRC, one of the things that uh, I'm doing now, um, I have, had already met um, the ambassadors um, here from the Great Lakes before I went to the DRC. I will meet them again uh, before issuing this statement to see what it is that we can stop. But I can tell you, until we have very serious conversations as a world in terms of how to regulate all these arms that are out there, in terms of um, how to ensure um, that there is all this free speech, but then what does it lead to in terms of um, social media and in terms of the kind of issues that are put out there, that there isn't much headway we will make. And also, until we are able to get the leaders of the world to come to the moment, the kind of moment they came to when they were creating the United Nations, um, when they were um, um, saying never again, and then all these never again moments that come and then the world is united and the, the world says we need to stop this. Until we get the world to get there, until we get especially the leaders um, who inform the geopolitics of the world to then speak with one voice on atrocity crimes, then it becomes very, very difficult. I would say um, one huge plus also is, uh, uh, you know, the, the atrocity prevention task force here in the US. Um, now the UK is in the process of creating one itself. Um, we've supported um, different governments, for example, in the Great Lakes region, um, all the countries there now um, have um, genocide prevention committees. So local ownership in terms of um, taking charge of preventing atrocity crimes uh, is extremely important. Thank you. We can go to, we've got now five, so we'll go, I saw Knox first and then we'll come to you and then we'll do four more. Let's take them all at, we'll take two, I'll take them all at once. Um, so, Sailor, can you, Knox is here with his hand up. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Knox Thames. I'm a senior visiting expert here at USIP and a former diplomat. First, thank you for your service. Uh, sadly, your mandate continues to grow with the increasing examples of atrocity crimes. Uh, two tough countries I want to ask you about, uh, China and Afghanistan. Uh, we all know that the uh, Office of the High Commissioner issued a, a, a really damning report on Chinese persecution of Uyghur Muslims. Uh, Many were very disappointed. The Human Rights Council voted against even taking up a discussion of that. Um, at about the same time, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan uh, discussed the risk of atrocities facing the Hazar community in Afghanistan at the hands of ISIS and the lack of Taliban protection provided by them. How are you engaging the Uyghur and Hazar communities and also the Chinese and not Afghan government, the Taliban? Um, one, you've got uh, the Chinese government with a documented list of, I think many would say are atrocity crimes against a religious minority. In Afghanistan, you've got a terrorist group specifically targeting the Hazar because of the religion and ethnicity. So I'd appreciate any insights you can provide. We'll come down here. We can take a few at, at once. And if you could be brief in your question just for timing purposes, that would be wonderful. Hello. Uh, first, thank you for uh, your service and thank you for being here. My name is Rami. I'm uh, a Palestinian scriptwriter and I am a refugee in Lebanon. Before I came here, I went uh, th through your quotes and uh, I have uh, one question or two questions about uh, one of these quotes. The quote says, conflict is a fact of life, violence and conflict do not mean the same thing because conflict involves choices that include interventions before it becomes violent. We must now join hands to work towards the kind of interventions that promote community ownership of peace. My question, do you think this applies on the Palestinian cause regardless of the non-stop killing of Palestinian innocent people uh, since more than 70 years? Israel have been killing anyone regardless of their ages, sex, men or women, old or children. I think it's unfair for us to shake hands with our enemy who committed violence and uh, massacres every day since 1948. My second uh, question is, do you address what's happening in uh, Palestine is a conflict? Thank you. Okay, you pass to just behind you. Please be very, please be very brief. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Katie. I am an undergraduate student at American University. Uh, mine's more of a logistical question, but I'm wondering how, what mediums you use to promote productive dialogue when a lot of people have pre-existing pre biases or prejudices against those they're engaging in conversation with. Hello, and my name is Predr Shatanovic. I'm a Peace Scholar Program Leader at American University. And a topic that seems to get forgotten, and uh, the Secretary General addressed this the other day, is Myanmar. Uh, I'm just wondering whether there are any processes going on right now to address the atrocities um, and to prevent them potentially from happening further in the future. Um, and yeah, if you can talk anything more about that, we would appreciate it. That's quite a bit of ground to cover, but please. So starting with, oh sorry, starting with the, um, the Afghanistan and the Hazara, um, we had a meeting this week with some minority communities uh, from Afghanistan. I'm not going to say about what because it could be dangerous for them. Uh, but I can tell you that um, on, and there are many, there is the Hazara, the Tajiks, the Sikhs, the Hindus. If quite a number, and some of them are almost extinct because of what's been happening there. There is some action we are going to take this week that I will not preempt if I preempt it now, um, 
just to say that anyway, that we are dealing with this issue. And we've dealt with it extensively. The Hazara, we have most close to two years research now on, on, on uh, the issues and we had, we've had meetings with so many uh, of them and there is definitely action that uh, you will see. Um, for the um, Uyghurs, uh, we know that um, Michelle uh, Bachelet issued the, the, the report just before she left and uh, that we have a new High Commissioner, Walker, and that he's just reported to Geneva. And so uh, we will pick up this issue with him. Um, the report itself doesn't specifically speak to genocide. It speaks to atrocity crimes. So we will follow up on this because uh, we needed a high commissioner to have this uh, conversation. So we, we are definitely following up on that. And then for the question on um, Palestine and whether I consider what's happening in Palestine to be a conflict, you know, when we teach about um, conflict and conflict prevention, we teach people that conflict, there's a difference between conflict and violent conflict. And violent conflict is what we try to avoid that conflict, it happens sometimes, you'll bump into somebody and then maybe uh, you'll say, why did you hit me like that? But then you will not get into a fight. Sometimes you, you like conflict is, you happen, there are so many conflicts that happen every single day. The fact that they shouldn't lead to violent conflict is the problem. So of course, what's happening in Palestine is violent conflict. So, but not conflict. In Kiswahili, we say that um, even the tongue sometimes gets into conflict with the teeth, and then the, if the teeth bites the, the tongue, but when the two of them, the, the teeth and the tongue, when they see food, then they reconcile. So, um, just explains like conflict, uh, it's not violent conflict. So, that quote speaks to that aspect, and it's good you've brought it out, because now I'll change it so that it can bring out the real meaning um, that uh, it was supposed to bring out. So, uh, add, um, so the question that I'd, uh, I'd spoken to on Palestine before speaks to it. Um, and then um, the issue of Myanmar, um, and I think I, I jumped one question. On the mediums that you use, is that the mediums that you use? Uh -huh. so, so we have a lot of um, idioms and, and, and methods. It depends on level of the conflict. It depends on um, who we are engaging with. I mediated for many years, so did I used to write lots of, um, um, uh, like I've even actually written a companion for women mediating armed conflict. Um, the kind of what they need to do um, in terms of dialogue, how they need to prepare, that kind of thing. So everything depends on the context. Everything depends on what you are trying to speak to and, um, and what you are trying to do and who is um, in the room. So there are different methods, but the key method, of course, has to have, um, sometimes it's mediation, sometimes it's, um, you know, there are it's a number of methods. Um, but if what you want to do is um, solve whatever is going on, then you have to study intensely. Always, um, I, I would say to myself before, when I used to mediate, that I'll try to know as more about the conflict that even those in the room who, to whom it's affecting, no, I'll try my best so that when they are speaking, then it's speaking to um, some knowledge that I have so that they don't say something and I respond in an insensitive way. So it's so important to learn a lot about the situation, then that informs the dialogue. On Myanmar, on the Rohingya, um, what's happening to the Rohingya, still happening, um, is extremely 
important in regards to like just giving an example to the world on what this can, can be done about this particular situation. I was in Bangladesh um, this year um, and spent a lot of time in Cox Bazaar with the Rohingya, just speaking with them and understanding what they feel about the current situation and where they came from. And in 2015, I was actually one of the people who went to Myanmar um, to help prepare the country for the elections. I was helping them to set up an early warning system, linking early warning to early response. And right now, we have uh, quite a number of mechanisms that are dealing with the Myanmar issue that are so uh, close to my mandate. Uh, because uh, we have the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, where the Myanmar government has been charged with, among other things, several counts of genocide. We have the ICC also is on the ground. We have the um, International Independent Mechanism for Myanmar that is led, mandated by the Human Rights Council and um, led by um, the UN. And all of this, um, because the charges are on atrocity crimes, we follow closely, we support closely. And um, the, uh, the International um, Court of Justice, um, the country that complained to the international, the, the broader charge against Myanmar is Gambia. And you know Gambia is this really small country that's even in the middle of Senegal. But they were able to take another um, the, the country of, um, of, of Myanmar to court. And they did so because they've ratified the Convention of Genocide. And we look forward to when other member states, other countries, member states of the UN can do so for other situations like around the world. So we are very supportive of the Gambian team, the Gambian prosecution team. We've also been very supportive towards the fact of uh, the, that so much of the mobilization of, uh, against the Rohingya um, happened on Facebook. And that Facebook then has now given this evidence to the uh, ICJ. So it's extremely useful. But I must say, um, in terms of being realistic and in terms of somebody like me who um, relied um, come from a country that um, relied on international courts um, sometimes to sort out um, issues. I would say that um, part of what we are crafting now and part of why this work that I'm talking about working with communities is so important is that international courts usually go for the person with the highest responsibility. So then you have then at the local level and it happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it happened in Rwanda, it happened everywhere, even after the Holocaust, where local level perpetrators are free. Nobody holds them accountable. And um, because the justice system is weak or the justice system is not willing to. So when I speak about the role that we have in terms of strengthening local level national mechanisms, um, it's extremely important that this happens because at the end of the day, um, the justice that we seek so much, and I talked about peace and justice working together, um, becomes extremely difficult um, to f feel that sense that um, it's happened. If, for example, you feel that the people at the local level, um, if you are seeing your rapist walking up and down every day, or you're seeing the person who killed your father and mother walking around every day, and you feel that there's nothing you can do about it, that there is so much that needs to be done about that particular aspect. So when you talk about linking the local and the, and the, and the the policy level, like in New York, those are the kind of conversations that I am having with ambassadors in New York and telling them, if the world was able to devise um, this international court, this international criminal justice system, that then takes care of the person with the highest responsibility, what do we need to do about the person, the people with the lower responsibility that are not being held to account? 
Alice, thank you so much for your sharing all of the, the work that you do. It's an impressive amount of work, a challenging mandate, uh, but it's been wonderful to hear how much you're doing, the richness of what you're doing, and how much you're pulling your background as a local peace builder into the office of the special advisor, the position of the special advisor. Thank you all for taking time to come and, and join us for this conversation. We appreciate your participation, and thank you, Alice, for your work. Thank you.